Thank you, Your Honor. All right. Thank you, Your Honor. Proceed. Uh, could we now play a plaintiff's exhibit number 401? Is your monitor working? Uh, uh, yes. <clears throat> Now, how did seeing that video, and in particular, the last line, stand up for righteousness? Vote yes on Proposition 8. Objection, Your Honor. Council represented this was a video that was produced by protectmarriage.com, <clears throat> proponent in this case. There has been no foundation to that effect. It doesn't appear that it is. And to the extent that the witness is going to testify as how this particular ad made him feel is of no relevance to this case. Boys. Your Honor, uh, what I said was that it was a campaign video featuring Ron Prentice, chairman of the protectmarriage.com. If counsel is saying it was introduced by somebody other than protectmarriage.com, that is something I, 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 uh, not, I don't have any knowledge about that. Uh, what it was was a campaign video. Everybody has agreed it was a campaign video, and it's featuring the chairman of protectmarriage.com, Ron Prentice, who played a very prominent role. Uh, the purpose of this is to show the effect these kinds of ads on, had on Mr. Katami and, and through him, other members of the gay community. I think it's uh, an entirely legitimate purpose, given Mr. Prentice's role in that, regardless of who actually produced the video. Anything further, counsel? Your Honor, just to the extent that it's being characterized as an ad campaign, <clears throat> an ad ca as a campaign video, suggests that it's part of an official campaign of Prop 8. Uh, and there is no foundation of that whatsoever. I believe the question to this witness is what his reaction was in seeing this exhibit. Mm -hmm. And I think the question is proper without regard to the specific origin of the campaign advertisement. Objection will be overruled. And I'll remind counsel, although this is a court trial, I do generally try to discourage speaking objections. I realize you may be a little more liberal with some of the rules of procedure here that would be true in any other jury trial, but you might bear that in mind. Very well. Do you have the question in mind? Uh, could you repeat the question, please? Sure. When you saw this video, and particularly the last tagline of the video that says, stand up for righteousness, vote yes on Proposition 8, how, if at all, were you affected by that? Well, I, mean, I, I, I do remember that campaign is, like this, th and this one included, I, w I would be saying, I would be lying if, <laughs> if I didn't say that that my heart was racing and 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 I was angry watching it I mean again stand up for righteousness <laughs> okay so we're a class of citizen or a category of people that need to be stood up against for some reason and not to mention you know what I find most disturbing is the reference to the devil blurring lines and don't deny Jesus like Peter did and this oncoming freight train well, I mean, what happens to you when a freight train hits you? You're, you're going to be either majorly harmed or, or killed by that, right? So to be categorized as a person that's part of a community that, that's part of an effort to do one thing, we, we want to do one thing? Look, we don't want to perpetrate against anyone. We don't want to force anyone to do anything. We, I love Jeff Zurio. I want to get married to Jeff. I want to start a family. I'm not going to go out and start some movement that's going to harm any institution or person or any child. I'm not. You know, and this is, this is offensive to people of faith. And I have a lot of friends who are people of faith. Mm -hmm. I mean, to categorize them as people of the, of the devil or even put them in the same category, I mean, of, of some effort that's likened to the devil blurring lines between right and wrong. I would think that those lines between right and wrong are talking about things that are bad in nature, mm -hmm. that harm people and society. We're not trying to do that. We, I just want to get married. I mean, it's as simple as that. I, I love someone, and I want to get married. And so an ad like this goes, again, it just demons. It demeans you. It just makes you feel 
like people are putting efforts into discriminating against you. And although they have the right to believe what they want to believe, it, it doesn't make that legitimate or reasonable to me in my life when it infringes upon my rights, and when it changes the way I identify myself or the way I feel about myself. That's unacceptable. Mm -hmm. uh, Your Honor, I would next offer Plaintiff's Exhibit 350, a video entitled Gathering Storm. This is a video that was released in 2009, and uh, again, I offer it subject to the objection. Your Honor, we have a further objection, which is that this particular video was not produced until after the Prop 8 campaign and, and the vote, and that it would be irrelevant to these proceedings. Now, the relevance. What is the relevance, Mr. Voice? Uh, the, the relevance, Your Honor, and, and when I offered it, I, I, I made it clear that it was a 2009 video. The significance of it is that even after the campaign for Proposition 8 was over with, there continued to be this campaign against gay people, this campaign portraying gay people as a threat. Now, this is a, pa a part of a pattern of discrimination that we've re referred to, and I think it's relevant to Mr. Katami's state of mind and the state of mind of other people, that they are subject to these kinds of attacks. Now, in some cases, uh, this may be more relevant than the campaign video than the campaign videos. In the campaign videos, they have the excuse that they were preparing things uh, because they were in the middle of a political campaign. That is something that is prepared, is is distributed. Uh, this is something that's prepared and distributed after the campaign is over with, and 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 it can have no function, as as I think the court will see. Uh, when it sees the video, other than to try to demonize gay people or, or to try to infer that somehow gay people have some kind of agenda that's a threat to society. Can you link this to the parties here? Your Honor, uh, could I have a moment on that? You may. Uh, Your Honor, I think it actually shows on the video that it was produced by the National Organization for Marriage, and I think uh, the formal name is, uh, which one of the largest uh, supporters, uh, which is one of the largest supporters of Proposition 8. Um, the defendants, you know, try to draw a distinction between what they call the official campaign and the unofficial campaign. In fact, it's all one campaign. And the attempt to sort of step back for the purpose of litigation and pretend that there was really only one official campaign and they didn't know anything about or, or have any knowledge of what was going on and it, with something else, I think is not credible. Particularly when you are talking about an organization like the uh, National Organization for Marriage that was uh, one of their primary funders. So uh, I believe this is sufficiently related to the campaign broadly defined. I also think that regardless of whether it is linked to the campaign, even if it were simply something that uh, had just come up from somebody who had no connection with the campaign, it is, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's relevant to the kinds of issues that the court is going to consider in terms of the appropriate standard. Uh, uh, whether it's uh, strict scrutiny on rational basis or, or somewhere in between as to whether this is a class of people that is subject to continuing discrimination. Your Honor, number one, this was not produced by protectmarriage.com and protectmarriage.com is not the national organization for marriage. Number two, it was after, months after the Proposition 8 campaign. Number three, the ad itself doesn't even reference Prop 8 or California. For all those reasons, including the fact that Mr. Katami has been identified to testify solely about sexual orientation and the harms he suffered as a result of Prop 8, any harm that could have flowed from this particular video is not a result of Prop 8. I'm inclined to think that the connections for the parties here are the suit and the issues is sufficiently tenuous that there would not be a basis for admitting Exhibit 350. You're proposing to admit it, Mr. Boyce, for purposes of showing an atmosphere of public attitude of homophobia. Mm. And I think there are other ways of establishing that. And this particular exhibit, given the lack of the connection to the parties at this lawsuit, I do not believe is appropriate for admission. Therefore, the objection will be sustained. 
Uh, Your Honor, let me then offer plaintiff's exhibit number one, which is the voter gu information guide for Proposition 8. And, and this also is one that uh, I have now checked was uh, identified on a timely basis. While you're moving to identify exhibits, did you move in 99 and 401? Yes, Your Honor, we did. It's not clear whether those were simply marked or moved for admission. I had offered those for evidence. Okay, let's see. 401 will be admitted subject to the qualification that I outlined, namely that the witness must be available at least 48 hours in the event that the proponents wish to examine him with reference to 401. So 99 and 401 will be admitted. Now, you're moving to Exhibit 1 that will be placed before this witness. Um, yes, may I approach, Your Honor? You may. All right. Mr. Katami, did you recognize this exhibit? I do. And what was it? Uh, it is the California Voter Information Guide mm -hmm. for 2008. Did you re review this in 2008? Yes. Uh, Jeff and I have a habit of reviewing these before elections. Your Honor, I would offer Exhibit 1. Very well. Exhibit 1 will be admitted. Let me ask you to turn to page uh, um, that is numbered in the bottom right-hand corner, 3365. And if we could put that up on the screen. And in particular, I'd like to direct your attention in the argument in favor of Proposition 8. Do you see that? Uh, I do. Uh huh. And on top of the page, its last two columns, and in the right-hand column, the next to last paragraph. Do you see that? Uh, did you s did you say the next to the last paragraph? Yeah, the next to the last paragraph. Uh, yes. It says, "Voting yes on Proposition Eight restores the definition of marriage that was approved by over 61 percent of the voters." Voting yes overturns the decision of four activist judges. Voting yes protects our children. Did you see that? Yes, I do. Mm -hmm. And uh, what was the reaction you had to that argument? Well, I mean, once again, it always seems to be the punchline of the message regardless of what. Jeff and I are informed voters, right? We do the reading, we discuss it, and when there are facts of merit, we're open to hearing them. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, we discuss them. But this punchline, again, of protecting children, and it's absolutely clear that because you see this recurring theme of protecting children, and I go back to, you know, what are you protecting the children from? I mean, do you protect them from harms that we put upon them? I mean, we're not a harm. So then that leads me to believe, how does this... How does this generate? How does, how does someone even think of, of putting protect your children in there? I mean, that language is indicative of, of some kind of perpetration against a child, mm -hmm. which leads me to believe that, that there is definitely a, I mean, it's discriminatory. It absolutely puts me into a category that I do not belong in. It, it separates me from the norm. It makes me into someone a part of, of a community that is that is perpetrating some sort of threat and that's not who we are or 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 what we're here about so i disagree with it wholeheartedly i think i think it's unfair and i don't think it represents the situation uh, now mr zurio testified that the two of you had decided not to register as domestic partners I'd like you to tell the court your reasoning for not choosing to register with the state of California as domestic partners. Well, we hear a lot of, you know, what's the big deal? You get most of the same rights, virtually all of the same rights. What's the big deal? Well, the big deal is, and we've discussed this, the big deal is it's creating a separate category for us. And that's a major deal because it makes you into a second third or, and as Mr. Olson said today, you know, a fourth class citizen now that we're actually recognizing marriages from other states. And everyone says, oh, but it's a huge stride, you know, you get rights. But we still have discrimination. So it's like, for lack of a better image, it's like putting a Twinkie at the end of the treadmill 
and then saying, you know, here's a bite, or here's another bite. <laughs> I mean, well, you want that Twinkie, you want the whole thing. I know it's rudimentary example of, of what it is, but I don't know, that's how it is. It's, it's not the same. I mean, oh, but you have the same rights. Yeah, but what am I supposed to do? Go have a domestic partnership ceremony and then a reception? It's not what you do. I mean, none of our friends have ever said, hey, this is my domestic partner. You know, by allowing us full access to those rights, not even the rights as much as it is, as it is the, the identity of, of being married, the full access to being uh, a full participant as, as a citizen of our country and our, and our state that's denied. And when your state sanctions something that, that segregates you, it fortifies people's biases, in my opinion. And it gives them an excuse to say, you know, it's not right, you don't deserve it because the state tells us that. And to me, that's fundamentally wrong. It's rooted in, in something that's fundamentally wrong. Because all I'm desiring, all I want is to be married. And, and that affects no one except for my husband, my family, my friends, you know, our, our concentric circles. And you know what, if it bolsters our profile in, in, in our society and, and our world, you know, that's good. <laughs> so be it. Because as long as we're sanctioned by our state to be told that, that we're different, regardless of, of how proud we want to be, regardless of how happy we are in our pursuits, we're still lacking. And to me, that's absolutely un-American. We're not a country about us and them. We're supposed to be a country about us, all of us, working in concert, doing things together. I mean, that's why we have these protections. My, my state is supposed to protect me. Not, it's not supposed to discriminate against me. Your Honor, uh, I have no more questions. Very well. Cross-examine. Your Honor, would it be possible that we take our lunch break now? And well, break? that's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Why don't we take our lunch and we'll recess until 1.30 this afternoon and we will resume with cross-examination of this witness. Very well, counsel. As the witness is coming to the stand, let me mention something. I mentioned this morning comments received from the Federal Bar Association and others simply for completeness for the record and to make sure that you have what is submitted to the court, although it pertains to the change in the local rules. In view of the proceedings of the Supreme Court, I think completeness of the record calls for that response of the Federal Bar Association to be made part of the record in this case, together with that submitted by the San Francisco Bar Association, an organization called the Equal Justice Society, the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights, and the American Civil Liberties Union, which appears to have been rather limber in the affiliations in this case. In addition, correspondence from the Director of the Administrative Office of the United States Courts to Chief Judge Kozinski, dated January 8, 2010, and Judge Kozinski's response to Mr. Duff and Judge Sirica the chairman of the executive committee of the Judicial Conference of the United States. To the extent any of these matters have any bearings on the further proceedings, they should be part of the record, and you can deal with them as you think is appropriate, but you certainly should have access to these. So I will direct that the clerk have these filed in the record. All right, Mr. Cooper. Further, Your Honor, to that question, how exactly will we have access to these documents you just referenced, number one? And number two, will we have access as well to the rest of this voluminous collection of comments? You want to take a look at those 138,000 plus responses? I'd be delighted to have you do it. I just didn't want to burden the record with all of them, but they are available. And I can't say that I've read every one of them, but I have read many of them. They're certainly available to everybody. But I thought that the organizational responses 
which deals specifically with the rules would be particularly helpful to you. And will those be available through PACER on the docket? Yes, sir. Thank you. Very well. Let me remind the witness you still are under oath. The oath you took this morning applies to this part of your testimony. Do you understand that? I do. Mr. Rahm, I believe it is. Yes. Thank you, Your Honor. Very well. Good afternoon, Mr. Katami. Good afternoon. We met uh, December 10th. Do you recall? I do. It's good to see you again. Thank you. Um, I would like your, to draw your attention to plaintiff's exhibit number 116. And if we could play that exhibit uh, and have you take a look at that, that would be helpful. Did you say 116? Yes. Thank you. Now, are you seeking to admit this exhibit? Uh, and, and you're showing it to the witness to see if it refreshes the recollection or if it's of general interest? Your Honor, I, I would like to show the witness the video. It has to do with the issue of Prop 8, the campaign, and the theme that the kids would be taught about same-sex marriage in schools, uh, which is something that he had testified to in, in, on his direct. My question is a little more limited. Are you moving the exhibit in? No, Your Honor, not at this time. Um, I would like him to view the video and then identify it, and we will move it in at the appropriate, appropriate time. Your Honor, I have no objection to the video, so we can offer it at this time. Very well. 116 will be admitted. Uh, well, okay. Mr. Katami, would you agree with me that the parents have the primary responsibility for raising their kids? I agree that parents have a primary responsibility for raising their kids, yes. And part of that responsibility includes the development of their moral character. <clears throat> part of that responsibility is that, yes. And part of developing a child's moral character would involve issues of human sexuality. Would, would you agree with that? Uh, I can't speak as a parent because I'm not one. I know that myself, as a parent, that would be part of my responsibility. Um, I mean, if I had differing views on, on certain aspects of sexuality, that would be my responsibility to impart that to my kids. And you testified today that you desired to be a parent, ultimately. Yeah, I do. Would you agree that issues relating to same-sex marriage uh, are for parents to discuss with their children uh, according to their own values and their own beliefs? Well, I think that works in tandem to what they learn in society and, and in school and then fortified in home, uh, depending on what the home vision is. And do you think that first and second graders should be taught about sex in the public schools? I'm not part of any unified school district or school district at all, so I can't speak to what is taught or what is not taught. I, I mean, you would have to define what you mean by sex exactly and, and how that's taught. Well, my question is to you. In your opinion, do you think kids as young as first and second grade should be taught about sex? In, in other words, traditional sex education, should that start in first and second grade? Do you think, yeah. you don't think that, do you? Objection, relevance. No, I haven't thought about it. I... Let me rule on the objection before you answer it. Objection over rule. I think the door was open to this line of direct examination. Proceed. Can you repeat the question, please? You, you don't think that kids as young as first and second grade should be taught a traditional sex ed curriculum, taught about the particulars of sex between individuals, do you? Well, again, not as a parent. I, I can't answer that question with any surety. I don't know. I, it depends on the curriculum. It depends on what's being taught and, and, and how it's taught. Well, do you think that kids are in first and second grade have the capability to process issues of sex? Do you, do you think that, Mr. Katami? Well, I'm not an expert on child development. I can't speak for every child across the country, but I do know that children are growing up a lot faster than they used to. So, I mean, I guess there's a potential yes to that question. Do you think it would be reasonable for someone, a parent, for instance, to disagree with you on that? 
It's reasonable that they can disagree, yeah. Well, you wouldn't have a problem with the public school teaching about same-sex marriage to first and second graders, would you? Again, I don't know the curriculum of the school system. I don't know what is taught and, or how it's taught. I, so I would have to look at the curriculum and see what's being taught and how it's taught. And it's something that I... I it, if it's something I disagreed with in my home and my children came to me and said, you know, this is what I learned... It's my mutual responsibility to impart my vision on those children so they understand that there are altering views or methods. Well, you had a particular objection to the Yes on 8 campaign ads to the extent to which that they, they pulled children into the equation. Isn't that a fact? Well, it was the manner in which they pulled children into the equation, yes. Well, I'd like to draw your attention to plaintiff's exhibit number one. If we could bring that up, that would be helpful. Um, Previously admitted into evidence? Yes, Your Honor. Now, Mr. Katami, you testified on your direct examination that you had a particular problem with part of this exhibit, uh, which is the official argument in favor of Prop 8 that voting yes would protect our children. You had a problem with that, didn't you? I have an issue that... Well, particularly... I'm sorry? Particularly, you took issue with being associated with something that was bad, uh, that somehow you had to be protected from children. You had a problem with that. Is that correct? I have an issue with the verbiage saying protect your children because to me that insinuates that you have to protect them from something that's going to harm you well and did you find that the ads that brought the children into the equation and claimed that kids might be taught about same-sex marriage in schools was misleading i did feel it was misleading well i would like to draw your attention to the top of plaintiff's exhibit number one the top right hand column do you see that that is on uh, 03365 do you see the top right-hand column that, start, that starts with, we should not accept? The resolution? I, I can't read it exactly. No, okay, there we go. Right. Yeah, thank you. Could you read the first four lines of that exhibit? Uh, we should not accept a court decision that may result in public schools teaching our kids that gay marriage is okay. That is an issue for parents to discuss with their children according to their own values and beliefs. It shouldn't be forced on us against our will. And in fact, that's what the Yes on 8, on Prop 8 campaign was seeking to protect children from. Am I right? Well, I can't speak to know exactly what they meant outside of this or with this exactly, but you know, again, the issue is with protect the children. I don't have an issue if it's taught in school. Again, the mutual responsibility is at home and with a parent. And ultimately, Proposition 8, for me, had nothing to do with children. I mean, we're missing the point completely here. This, this is, to me, a tactic to divert from what the truth of the situation is. It's is that the state give, gave me a right, stripped the right away from me, and that right is something that I think is inalienable, inalienable, yeah, sorry, inalienably mine. You know, and therefore, the issue of children is angering, is an issue and a problem to me because of the way it's presented. But is it the whole issue? No. Is what I consider potentially a diversion away from the issue? Yes. The fact is you had a particular problem with the ads because you thought that they were misleading. That, in fact, kids were not going to be taught in schools. It, is that true? At one point, my understanding was to believe that kids may not be taught in school. That it wasn't for a fact sure that every state that would pass or legalize gay marriage would be required to teach gay marriage in school. So that, again, it becomes an issue for me based on the language, the tactic, and what it insinuates, which does not sit at the core of the issue for what, how it affects me. Well, there is nothing in this ad that's, that says that the, yes on eight, yet, that the Yes on Prop 8 campaign wanted to protect children against you because you were bad, right? I mean, it didn't say anything like that, did it? This ad doesn't literally state it. That's not what I'm asking. It, it does not literally state it, does it? This ad does not literally state that there is a harm. It insinuates one to me. Thank you, Mr. Katami. And the video that we played about the couple in Massachusetts didn't say anything about the fact that same-sex couples were bad. It didn't say anything. It didn't say that in the ad, did it? That ad... Uh did not literally state that same-sex couples are bad. But it is definitely insinuated in the emotion of the ad, in the language of the ad, in the bullet points that were obviously provided for the ad. I mean, yes, to me, that 
watching that ad absolutely insinuates that there is some disapproval of gay people and, and that they should be feared. Again, using the terminology, protect your family, protect your children, every time you see that or hear that, to me it means you're protecting your children or, or family from something that's going to harm them. I mean, regardless if, it's, if it states it legit, not, not legitimately, if it states it literally or not, it does not legitimize the fact that these people are allowed to have their beliefs. But the minute they turn a belief into an action that, that legally sanctions my rights, there's an issue there. So you believe that parents can disagree on the issue of same-sex marriage, but they have no right to do anything about it. That's not what I said. I, I see. The fact is that the ad that we played that has been admitted into evidence specifically points out that these parents were concerned that their kids would be taught about same-sex marriage in first and second grade. That's, that's what they were concerned with. And in fact, it did happen in Massachusetts, didn't it? I don't know for a fact. It do, did. do you have any evidence or reason to believe that what these parents said on that video was inaccurate? Do you have any evidence to that effect? I do not have any evidence to state that what they're saying is inaccurate, but I also believe that, it, <clears throat> that a video might be playing. <laughs> Um, it, uh, it doesn't also exclude in my mind the fact that they could be arguing about any other number of things that those kids learn in school. And perhaps parents disagree with a lot of the curriculum. So that is an issue that is taken to the school board, as they did, and resulted in a decision that it had resulted in, and therefore the responsibility falls back on them. So do you then open the door for all these parents that disagree with things in the schools to, you know, no, I, I mean, is this an opportunity for them? This is an opportunity for them. They took the opportunity <laughs> to the courts and tried to rectify it in their way. And, and, it, and it didn't fall on their side. But again, they, they get to have their beliefs. So should they impose those beliefs on, on others when it comes to legal matters? Well, not in my eyes. When it comes to talking to their children, Perhaps their, their situation could have been really summed up and wrapped up in a conversation with their children saying, you know, hey, you know what? You learned that in school, but we don't necessarily believe that in our home, or we don't necessarily agree with that. What then goes to some disapproval towards gay people? And the official ballot language indicated that the issue of same-sex marriage should be for parents to, dis to discuss with their children according to their own values and beliefs. And you testified that you agreed with that. In addition to that. And, and I'm asking, all I'm asking is whether you agreed with that. That's the one, the only thing that I'm asking you. Agreed with what, sir? Whether, whether same-sex marriage is an issue for parents to discuss with their children according to their own values and beliefs. You agreed with that concept, uh, do you not? The concept that parents should be able to discuss that with their children? The one that I just read to you. That's what I'm saying. Clarifying it for me. I, like, I didn't write this language. So yes, for me, that means it's in conjunction with societal things. If they're watching TV, I mean, there's a lot of other influences. So does a parent have a responsibility? And is it their right? Absolutely. Does that prohibit people from seeing or, or learning about other real truths in their lives? No. So if they had an outside source, you know, what if their child had gone to a movie and there had happened to be a gay character who was married? I mean, would he ask the same question? Perhaps. Is it the parent's responsibility to have that discussion? I want to go back to the first question I asked you, that it's the parent's primary responsibility to raise their kids, and you agree with that? Correct. Okay, and your objection to the protect our children theme was one which you thought was misleading, uh, that there was nothing that these kids needed to be protected against. Isn't that a fact? Once again, my, my view... I, I'm asking you a yes or no question. I mean, did you think that these kids did not need to be protected? Is that what you thought? Let's just do it one question at a time, okay? Ex excuse me. Okay. Can you repeat the question, please? Is it your opinion that there was nothing that kids needed to be protected against? Objection, Your Honor. It was my opinion. Uh, Objection. 
Perhaps you can rephrase that, Mr. Rahm. That's just a little far afield. Um, I'm sorry. You testified that you had a problem with the part of what's in evidence as plaintiff's ex exhibit number one that says that we need to protect our children. You testified to that today, correct? I did. Okay. And the fact is, you don't think that kids need to be protected from exposure to same-sex marriages, relationships, excuse me, relationships, correct? My opinion, same-sex relationships are not something to be protected from. There's nothing wrong with it in your opinion, correct? Same-sex relationships? Yes. Nothing, nothing wrong with it. Nothing wrong with it at all. But the fact is that what the Yes on 8 campaign was pointing at is that the kids would be taught about same-sex relationships in first and second grade. Isn't that a fact, that, that, that's what they were going, that that's what they were referring to? I don't know that for a fact in first and second grade. Well, you, do you recall when we took your deposition, right? Yes. Well, that was December 10th, 2009. Correct. It would, I would like you to refer to page 63 of the deposition transcript. Your Honor, do you, do you have a copy? I believe the clerk is retrieving a copy now. Very well. What page, Mr. Rahm? Uh, that's page 63, Your Honor. Very well. Does the witness have a copy of his deposition? Uh, I do. Boy, it's on the screen here. Okay. Reading from uh, your deposition that's dated December 10th, 2009, starting at line 18, it says, question, Okay, when you talk about the points regarding the schools, are you referring to the assertion that kids would be taught about same-sex marriage in the schools? Answer, it was a multi-fold, it was about the kids' textbooks being written to exclude same-sex marriage, excuse me, textbooks being written to include same-sex marriage. I believe mar rewritten. 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 I'll start again. <clears throat> Answer, it was multi-fold, it was about the kids' textbooks being rewritten to include same-sex marriage, part of the campaign from what I remember, also for the campaigning that was resolved around kids being taken to a lesbian wedding at a school outing and how that would be acceptable. And potentially there would be school outings to gay marriages and so on and so forth. Question, and it was your position that that was a misrepresentation. That would not happen and could not happen. Answer, from my understanding from following news stories and trying to be as educated as possible, from my understanding, that was absolutely not the case or was not going to be the case that there wasn't going to be an immediate reprinting of textbooks or permission slips to go to gay marriage. Were you asked those questions and did you give those answers? I did. I'd like to refer to plaintiff's exhibit 15 and I would move it into evidence if there is no objection. Uh, do you have a copy? Page. Uh, hold on, hold on. This is exhibit what, Mr. Rahm? Uh, this is plaintiff's exhibit number 15. 15, all right. PX 15. Campaign video? Yes. One from the official campaign? Yes. No objection, Your Honor. Very well. You're seeking to admit 15, correct? <laughs> yes, Your Honor. Very well. 15 will be admitted. No further questions, Your Honor. Very well. Direct, Mr. Bowes. Yeah. Yes, please, Your Honor. <clears throat> now, as you understood it, was there anything in Proposition 8 about what was going to be taught in schools? No. Was there anything in Proposition 8 that talked about whether kids would be taught about sex in second grade as opposed to sixth grade or eighth grade? To my understanding, not at all. No more questions, Your Honor. Very well. Then, Mr. Katami, you may step down, sir. Now, you have to be on call for at least 48 hours for possible questions with respect to Exhibit 401. But with that, you may step down, sir. The plaintiffs would call Kristen Perry. Kristen Perry, called as a witness for the plaintiff herein, having been personally sworn, was examined and testified as follows. I do. State your name. Kristen Matthews Perry. Spell your first name and your last name, please. K R I S T I N P E R R Y. 
Ms. Perry, are you a plaintiff in this case? Yes, I am. Would you tell us briefly about your background, where you were born, just a brief summary of your age, your educational background, just a brief summary, please. I was born in Illinois, but my, my, my parents moved here with me when I was two years old. Uh, so I've lived in California since I was two years old, and I'm 45 years old now. I've grown up, I, I grew up in Bakersfield, California. I attended grammar school, middle school, and high school there. And then I, I moved away to go to college at UC Santa Cruz. And from there, I went to San Francisco State to get my master's degree in social work. And I've worked in the Bay Area ever since. Describe without, you don't have to identify the name of your employer, but you, you work for a government agency. I, I would like you to describe the work that you do, your profession. My entire career, I've worked in the field of child protection, child development, family support. I, I started out as a child abuse investigator in, in a Bay Area County. And from there, I moved into prevention services for families that were at risk. I became a supervisor and a program manager. And then later on, I, um, I became the executive director of a county agency that supported at-risk at children, zero to five. So and how? At this time, I, I'm the executive director of a statewide agency that provides services and support with families from with children from zero to five. So how long have you professionally been engaged in the occupation of working with children? For almost 25 years. On behalf of government agencies of the state of California, did I hear correctly? I've spent my entire career working for the government. What is your relationship with the plaintiff, Sandra Steer? Sandy's the woman I love, and we live together in Berkeley. And what is the composition of your family? Is it just the two of you? No. No, Sandy and I live together in Berkeley with our children. We have a, a blended family. We are both brought two sons into our relationship, and Sandy's children are both college age, and my children are both high school age. When did you meet Miss Steer? Sandy and I met, I, I think, in 1996 when we were both working at the same place. And describe how that relationship, again, in general terms, how did that relationship grow, and what did it grow into? Well, I remember the first time I met Sandy, thinking that she was maybe the sparkliest person that I ever met, and I wanted to be her friend. And we were friends for a few years. And our, rela our friendship became more and more, and it became deeper and deeper over time. And then after a few years, I began to feel that I, I might be falling in love with her. And did it work out that way? It, it did work out that way. I, I did fall in love with her. I did. And how did she feel about you? She, she told me that she loved me, too. <laughs> we will be asking her to verify that. <laughs> <laughs> OK. How would you describe your sexual orientation? Um, I'm a lesbian. And tell me what that means in your own words. What does it mean to be a lesbian? Well, for me, what that means is I have always felt a strong attraction and interest in women and formed really close relationships with women. And I've only ever fallen in love with women. And, and the happiest I feel is in my relationship with Sandy, because I, I'm in love with her. Do you feel that that's something that could change, that you could have, um, could you have been in the past interested in that same kind of bonding with men, or do you feel that it would be, I know this is somewhat compound, or do you feel that that could turn into, that could develop in that way in the future? Let's see, which question would you like her to answer? <laughs> Do you feel that in the past you could have developed that same kind of bond with a man? I was unable to do that. I, as I said, I grew up in Bakersfield, California, and it was the 70s and the 80s, and all of my friends as we were getting older and older were beginning to date and becoming more and more interested in boys. And I, I, I recognized that that was something that would have been the best thing for me to do if I could. And, and I did date a few boys because it was, it, it would make life easier, you know. And, and then I would have a date to go to the prom too, or I, or I could go to a party too. But as I got a little bit older, it, it became clear to me that I, I didn't feel the same way that my friends felt about boys, and there was something different about me. 
Do you feel that you were born with those feelings, with that kind of sexual orientation? Yes, I do. Do you feel it could change in the future? Do you have a sense that it might somehow change? I'm 45 years old. I don't think so. <laughs> Why are you a plaintiff in this case? Because I want to marry Sandy. I want to have a stable and secure relationship with her that we can include our children in. And I want discrimination we're feeling from Proposition 8 to end and for a more positive and joyful part of our lives to begin. What does the institution of marriage mean to you? I mean, why do you want that? Well, I've never really let myself want it until now. Mm -hmm. Growing up a lesbian, you don't let yourself want it because everybody tells you you're never going to have it. So in some ways, it's, it's, it's hard for me to grasp what it would even mean. I, I do see other people who are married, and, I, and I, I think that that's what it looks like, that you're honored and respected by your family. Your children know what your relationship is, and, and when you leave your home and you go to work or you go out into the world, people know what your relationship means. And so then everybody can, in a sense, join in supporting your relationship, which at, at this point I can only observe as an outsider. I don't have any first-hand experience with what that must be like. Does it matter that the state is announcing that this is a relationship officially recognized by the state of California marriage? Yes. And is that part of something that goes into why you want this to happen to you? I want it to happen for me because I do everything else I can, everything I can think to, to make myself a contributing and responsible member of this state. And this state is letting me, not letting me feel happy. It, it's not letting me experience my full potential because I'm not permitted to experience everything I might feel if this barrier were removed. Did you and Ms. Steer ever attempt to be married? We did. Tell us what happened, I mean, when that was and exactly what your experience was. Well, in um, 2003, I proposed to Sandy without any of the knowing that everything that's developed regarding gay marriage in California was about to develop. And instead, I, I, I did it as a way to express my personal interest in marrying her. Tell me about your proposal. What happened? Well, it was around Christmas, and we live in a part of Berkeley that's, that's hilly, and we, we live near this really high rock that's called Indian Rock. <clears throat> And if you get up high enough on it and you sit there, you can see the whole Bay Area laid out in front of you. And I, I, I knew I wanted to pro propose to her because we could always walk back there and, and sit there if we wanted to. So I took her on a walk. And she didn't know I had a ring. And, um, and we sat down on the rock, and I put around, my arm around her, and I said, will you marry me? And she looked really happy. And then she, she looked really confused. And, um, and she said, well, what is that, um, what is that exactly, what does that mean? How will we even do that? And then, and then we had to invent it for ourselves. So we had to figure out what to do. So that was in December of 2003. Mm. So what did you and, I'm, I'm going to call her Sandy, uh, what did you and Sandy do to then invent the relationship that you were hoping to have with her um, that you had proposed? We started basically trying to figure out the day we would like to be married and the place and who we'd like to have join us and how we might, what we might say to each other. So we just started planning and and as we were in the midst of doing that, private family and friend ceremony planning, we, we, we learned that City Hall and the County of San Francisco, that they were permitting same-sex marriages. And that was while we were in the middle of the planning. This was in early 2004. That's correct. Uh -huh. Is that correct? And, and, and you learned in some ways that the mayor of the City of San Francisco had authorized the issuance of marriage licenses and the performance of marriage in San Francisco. Am I stating that correctly? Yes. That was in the early part of 2004? Yes. For us, it was February of 2004. And what, did you act on that information? I did. 
I did. I and Sandy and I were both reading about it in the newspaper, and we talked about whether or not we want, want to go to San Francisco to have this this marriage, and then we continued with our other plans, and, and that's what we decided we wanted to do. So we made an appointment, and we went to City Hall, and, and we brought all the boys and my mom, and we were married in City Hall. And how did you feel about that marriage coming about in the City Hall in San Francisco at that time? Well, as amazed and happy as I could ever imagine feeling. And I said a moment ago that I, I never let myself imagine that. So in some ways, I, the feelings were new to me. I didn't really know what they were. And, and I'm still confused by these experiences because they're not the ones that have been, um, I, haven't, I haven't let myself want to feel them. So I have a sense that it's an almost otherworldly experience, like, like floating above a ceremony and saying, oh my god, that's me getting married. And I never thought this would happen. Did you then, after that ceremony, go forward with this private ceremony that you had planned? We did. We continued those plans because <clears throat> only a few people are, <coughs> are kids and and my mom attended the ceremony in City Hall, and we wanted to continue with the other ceremony so that more people could see and come, and, and we would see everybody. Did you have a party, a ceremony, an exchange of vows? We did. We did. We planned an afternoon in Berkeley where our friends and our family had joined us, and um, we had a small ceremony. And then we all came inside, and there was a big celebration. How many? How many people? It's about a, a hundred guests. What month was that? That was August 1st. Of 2004? Yes. After that, was there a decision by a California court having to do with the ceremony that you entered into in San Francisco at City Hall? Yes. A few weeks after our August ceremony, the state Supreme Court ruled that, um, that the San Francisco weddings were invalid. What was your reaction when you heard that? Well, um, the part of me that was disbelieving and unsure in the place in the first place was confirmed. Uh, the fact really is almost when you're gay that that you think you don't really deserve those things. So it did have this sense of, well, you know, I really didn't deserve to be married. Did you receive notification, official notification, that your marriage was null and void? Yeah. The city and county of San Francisco sent us a letter after they, um, after the ruling, and it was a form letter, and our names were typed on the top, and it said, we are sorry to inform you that your marriage is not valid, and we would like to return your marriage fees to you, and would you like them by check or donated to a charity? And, um, and so that was the... That's when we knew for sure we weren't married in San Francisco anymore. And what feelings did that evoke, that experience? That I'm not good enough to be married. Sometime in 2008, uh, the California Supreme Court rendered a decision, I, I think it was May of 2008, that marriage could be obtained by same-sex individuals irrespective of sexual orientation. Do you remember that decision? I do. What did you feel when you heard that the California Supreme Court said that you had a constitutional right to marry the person of your choice? I, I was elated to hear it. I really was. And I know that Sandy was too because we talked about that ruling when it happened. And um, after we had known about it for a little while, we started to hear our friends talk about plans to get married, and we were very excited for them. And then, of course, uh, we asked ourselves, would we get married again? And it didn't take more than a, a few minutes, really, for us to... It was, it was unanimous that we couldn't. We couldn't bring ourselves to do it again right then. The experience in 2004 had really... We hadn't really recovered from it. And I didn't feel at that time, given what was going outside the Supreme Court, 
ruling um, in the political world that it was necessarily a permanent solution there, and we decided that the impermanent solution before, and we decided not to go forward at that time. Were you aware that people were organizing an effort to overturn that California Supreme Court ruling? Yes. Decision, excuse me. Yes, I was aware that there was a campaign starting. What became Proposition 8? You were aware that there was an effort going on to put a measure on the ballot to overturn the California Supreme Court decision. I remember media reports of um, groups or individuals saying we disagree and we'll have to take action and the sort of the beginning of what resulted in the ballot initiative. And that was a ballot initiative that came on the ballot in November of that same year. Is that correct? Correct. Now, what was it like for you to be a citizen, to watch and listen to the campaign to overturn that California? Can you just relate your reactions to what was going on around you in the political world on that subject? Well. I mean, I'm just, uh, I'm a California resident, so I could see evidence at the campaign, and I commute on the local highway, and I'd see the bumper stickers every day. And I did see some of the television ads. When in particular, I remember I some, saw some posters on people's lawns, but um, that was about it. What did you, you say you saw one ad in particular. What do you remember about that? Uh, well, it struck me as being sort of an education-focused ad because there was a moment where they showed the ed code in the ad. The education code? Yeah. The California education code, which I'm sort of interested in, so it got me interested in that ad. And it um, did talk about needing to protect your children from learning about gay marriage in school. That was the gist of the ad. How do you feel, did you feel about that? Uh, you work with children every day. I do. Well, I, I work on their behalf. I remember feeling that the ad was attempting to create a sense of fear and worry in me and that the solution would be to vote yes on Prop 8. It was kind of, kind of this, for that kind of a feeling that kind of simplified this complex thing about relationships into being a bad thing. And, and then they said, if you wanted to fix a bad thing, do this. And I felt essentially that it was very simplified. As a parent, did you have a reaction to the Proposition 8 campaign? Uh-huh, I did. I felt that it didn't represent how I feel about my children or their friends and that I feel compelled all of the time to be protective of them without thinking. And so this message was that maybe I was in a group of people who wouldn't be protective of children. And it didn't match the way I feel about them. Did you feel that voters were being warned that they needed to protect their children from you? Yes. I did. And I felt like I was being used and that the fact that, you know, I'm the way that I am and I can't change the way that I am. Be, be, by, by, I was being mocked and made fun of and disparaged and in that way and I really didn't have any response to it. I, I, just, I just had to know that people feel that way. Do you, as you go through life every day, feel that uh, the other effects of discrimination on the basis of your sexual orientation? Every day. Tell us about that. Well, when I was an adolescent and beginning to become more and more aware of my sexuality, I struggled to feel like everybody else, to look and feel like everybody else. And for it to even be a struggle in the first place was hard. And I, I was well aware of the comments and the jokes that were circulating through my school all the time. And, and some of them were directed at me. And as I got older and clearer about who I was and I could say that I was a lesbian out loud, that would be met at times with criticism or skepticism. And, and what I want to say about me being out is that you, you know, I, I go to great lengths to not have that happen. I, I don't want to draw people's criticism. In fact, quite the opposite. I would really like for people to like me. So since I, I, I know that I have this trait and I can't change that, that, that people don't like it, I, I, I go to great lengths to have traits that people do like. So I put a significant amount of time and energy into being likable so that when the discriminatory things happen, I, I can just turn it around. So if, for example, um, 
I'm on a plane, and, and, and somebody comes up, and I've saved a seat for Sandy, and she's not there yet, and they say, is that saved? I say, yes, and they say, for whom? And I say, for my partner, and they say, could you please move so I could sit there? Or if we're in a restaurant or a store and we travel through the store together, people want to know if we're sisters or cousins or friends. And I have to decide every day if I want to come out everywhere I go and take the chance that, that somebody will have a hostile reaction to my sexuality and, and just go there and, and buy the microwave. So we went in there to buy without having to go through that again. And the decision every day to come out or not to come out at work or at home or at the PTA, at music, at soccer, it's exhausting. So much of the time I choose to do as much of what I can handle doing in any given day. Was coming out something that took a long time for you to do? Was it difficult? It was sort of gradual, but probably not so long. I think probably by the time I was 18 or 19, I, I did know that I was able to talk to about myself about that, and then I could, I could tell it to people over the next few years. But it's, it's what you often hear lesbians and gays say. I feel like once I realized that about myself, then I could say, I, I think that I've been gay from the very beginning. But it was a gradual process at first. You've had to explain this to your children? Yeah. Was that difficult? Well, they don't know me any other way, so, you know, it's different probably if you were living as a heterosexual person, but for me, it might have always been their mom, and in their entire lives I've been out, so. Have you and Sandy entered into a registered domestic partnership in California? Yeah. Tell us when you did that. That was in, um, August 2004. Was that easy to do? Does California make it simple? Yeah, I think it was just a form. That you submit to the state? That we, we completed it. I think we had to have it notarized and then we mailed it in. What does domestic partnership mean to you compared to marriage? Well, we are registered domestic partners based on just the legal advice that we received for creating an estate plan. So we saw a lawyer who works with couples on those things, and we completed a bunch of <coughs> forms, a durable power of attorney, a last will and testament, and she recommended that we also do a domestic partnership agreement at the same time. So there was just a number of those kind of documents that we completed. You regarded it as something of a property transaction or a state planning transaction. It was. Well, that's when we did ours during that process, and it was, I. I I believe it was it has some unique features that was a little different from a durable power of attorney or a will and so we we completed it and it allows us access to each other's health benefits and some other benefits through our employers is it as good as marriage to me they're not the same thing at all you, you know I I viewed the domestic agreement as precisely that an agreement a legal agreement, and in some ways it memorializes some of our responsibilities to each other, but it, it isn't the same thing as a celebration or something we, we, we don't remember that's the day that we invited people over on. We just did that as part of the things we did as a couple to protect ourselves since we can't get married. One of the issues that the court is going to have to deal with is how that domestic partnership, how is that domestic partnership relationship different to you than marriage? And why is it that you want marriage so much when you have this opportunity? Well, I, I, I don't have access to the words that describe my relationship right now. I'm a 45 year old woman. I've been in love with the same woman for 10 years and I don't have a word to tell anybody about that. I, I, don't, I don't have a word. Would the word do it? Well, why would everybody be getting married if it didn't do anything? I think it must do something. It appears to be really important to people, and I would really like to use the word too, because it symbolizes maybe the most important decision you make as an adult, who you choose. No one, no one does it for you. You weren't born with that as your cousin or your uncle or your aunt. You choose them over everybody else, and you, 
you want to feel that it's going to stick. And that you'll have the protection and the support and the inclusion that comes from letting other people know that you feel that way. Do you think it would matter in your neighborhood, in your community, that you would be able to say that you and Sandy were married? Would it cause people to treat you differently? I think it would be an, or an enormous relief to our friends who are married. Our straight heterosexual friends that are married almost view us in a way that's I know they love us, but I think they feel sorry for us, and I, I can't stand that. You know, many of them are in their second marriage or their first marriage, and nevertheless, they have a word, and they belong to this institution or this group. And I, I can think of a time recently when I went with Sandy happily to a football game at the high school where two of our kids go, and we went up to the bleachers, and we were greeted with these smiling faces of other parents sitting there and, and waiting for the game to start. And I was so acutely aware that I thought, they're not married. They are all married, and I am not. It sounds to me like your heterosexual friends don't feel threatened if you were to get married. The same-sex marriage doesn't sound like it threatens them. <laughs> No. The friends we have, I think, would feel better about their marriages if we could be married, too. This would feel like they, they get to help support our family in a way that's familiar to them, makes sense to them. I, right now, they're a little bit unsure, but like, just like all of us are, of what we should all be doing because we're outside of any sort of tradition. It's just, it's just the sort of thing that we invented that no one but us understood. You've heard the argument, I, I think, probably in various different places, that allowing you to get married to a person of the same sex would damage the institution, the traditional institution of marriage. Do you agree? Objection, Your Honor. Sustained. Sustained.